So I work in the nanotechnology group in the Tyndall National Institute, and uh, the Tyndall is down there in the Lee Maltings. Uh, there's 450 people employed down there, so it's a big employer, 150 of which are PhD students. Um, and that's doubled in the last number of years. It was about 70 PhD students five years ago, we're now up to 150. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about nanosensors, uh, give a little bit of an overview on them, explain why we use them, why they're interesting. Specifically, I'm going to target the kind of the health sector, although they have application in many other uh, sensing sectors. Um, and also finally then show where what some of the work we're doing and then we're a, one a video of a European vision of where these sensors are going to go in, in the next 10 years time so sensing as we know all human beings well most human beings are equipped with um five senses so we we experience the world through these senses through sight through hearing through taste through touch and through smell but what happens when we want to um explore other aspects that we're not uh, equipped to deal with. So if we want to say look at a distant star or, or find the temperature of, of a volcano, so the human body isn't equipped to do that, well not, not twice anyway. And um, So we need to add or develop some sort of instrumentation, some sort of um, device that will, 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 will look at what we want and come back and tell us in some sort of sensible uh, way uh, what it actually is that we're trying to look. So sensors have been around for years. In the old days um, Miners used to use a poor old canary when they were down digging for coal. And if the canary keeled over and died, it was an ex you know, a good example that there was marsh gas there and you'd want to do a legger fairly quick so uh, you wouldn't be poisoned. Uh, other uh, examples of, tip of sensors on a daily basis are, say, a pressure sensor there um, when you're pumping up your car tyre. Uh, and the primary goal of these the sensors is to detect an event or danger in time so that some action can be implemented. So to do sensing, you need to measure a property that correlates to what you want to know. Okay, so when you go to the nano scale, if you want to measure something small, it's actually better to use something small. So when I, what is small? That, that is a question. So this graph here is just to review size and just put things a little bit in perspective, if I can. This is a, a scale here on the left where the top is one meter and the end here is 10 to the minus 10 meters or one angstrom. And these are items that we see every day in the world through our own senses. So this is, this is my Springer Spaniel. And she's about 75 uh, centimetres long. A sugar cube there is about a centimetre square. But, and then once we start decreasing down, this is where the human sense is cut off and we start needing instrumentation to actually show us what's there. So these are scanning electron micron images of different objects. This is a pinhead. This is a human hair, which is approximately 50 microns in diameter. These are red blood cells. Uh, as you go further lower again, as you start entering into the sub-micron regime, the wavelength of light fits in here between 400 and 700 nanometers. Um, and where we work is, is in areas smaller than that. So these are examples of some devices <coughs> and some items that we're looking at in Tyndall. So these are nanowires, which I'll, I'll go through later on, that they're, they're made at Tyndall and they're 100 nanometers wide. Um, and we use those for sensing various uh, biological uh, molecules such as interleukin here, which is um, a complementary protein expressed in the human body. And that's about eight nanometers in radius. Uh, recently, Jean, Professor Jean-Pierre Collange created the first uh, silicon um, field effect transistor uh, nanowire device that was junctionless, and that is only five nanometers wide. And that compares then to DNA, uh, the width of which is only about two nanometers. And if you're going to go down really small, you look at a carbon atom, which is about 0.22 nanometers, 2.2 angstroms. So, the reason we start looking at nanosensors is the, the, the stuff we want to measure is on the same scale as the nanosensor. And I'll explain later on, that gives you higher sensitivity and, and higher signal to noise and gives you a better response. So what's enabled this, and it, it's happened over the last 15 years that there's been a convergence between mostly the microelectronics industry, such as Intel, driving down the size of their transistor devices. So you're going from your, your Pentium to your Pentium Plus to your you know, Intel Core processors and the gate length of your transistor is now getting smaller and smaller and smaller and standing at about 43 nanometers as far as I understand at the moment. At the same time, synthetic approaches from chemistry, physics and biologists has been improving. So we're able to make bigger, bigger um, entities, super molecules, nanocrystals with more controlled um, properties that are more reproducible 
and a lot easier than previously had been. And they converged there in the kind of early noughties, late nineties. And the convergence of this then is emerging, is enabling emerging nanoscale devices in electronics and in photonics and in sensing in particular that give much more enhanced performance and give you much greater f functionality at, in a much smaller area. Okay, so in general, the voices have been shrinking anyway. So this is back in the 80s, 90s, going to the latest uh, iPod Nano, right? Similarly, televisions have shrunk, okay? Nano sensors as well have, so this is an old Hitachi system here. You can see how big it is, and no pretty much can do the exact same um, work on a, sim on a simple silicon chip, which is obviously a lot, lot cheaper to make. The only thing that hasn't followed this trend that's outside the scope of this talk is earphones, because for some reason they've got bigger, and I don't understand why. Right. So what's driving sensors falling? Right? And that is um, the drive in uh, nanochemistry and uh, biochemical sensors. Okay. And you can see there, this is, this is old data now, but um, the markets were really driven up to 40 billion units being produced in the States alone back in 2010. And that was driven by new trends in healthcare, particularly towards what they call point of care. Right. So we'll give you two scenarios. Right? Scenario one is you're feeling sick. You go to the GP, right? You can't get bloods taken, usually about 20 bills in four bottles. It's sent off to some mysterious lab somewhere who may or may not lose it. The analysis are done, it takes a couple of weeks to come back, your GP rings you, in which case sometimes it might be too late, okay? <laughs> Scenario B is what we call point of care. You walk into the doctor, the doctor takes a pinprick of blood, puts it into a machine, figures out what's wrong with you, gives you instant treatment, and it helps you get better faster. A typical example of this is, is a lot of people do it on a daily basis, four times a day, is that's glucose sensing, where you actually check your glucose levels in your blood and you administer insulin as required. Okay, and because of this need for our drive for point of care, and it's, it's, it's driven principally through e an economic understanding that population in the world, in the developed world, is getting older and it's living longer. So there's an awareness that the cost of medical intervention is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger with time. So the idea is to try and remove something from primary care and get it back into the GP's office or get it back into the home. So the, the disease diagnostics is done at a much, much earlier level. That A, reduces cost, which is a main driver, but B, <coughs> also it, it improves your chance of survival. That if you, if you can detect a disease earlier in its earlier stages, like a cancer, you have a higher chance of surviving that than if it's detected too late. Um, and these are examples of point of care devices that are on the market. This is obviously a, blo a blood glucose monitoring sensor there. And you also have this new, have to be released by Abbott, it's called an ISTAT. And these are available in accident emergency hospitals, uh, wards and hospitals. And as soon as you come in, they'll take a drop of blood. And this thing in the two, two or three minutes will give you the blood gases, your electrolytes uh, and, and various other uh, biomarkers, which will inform the clinician pretty much what, what's wrong with you on a serious load and allow them to make uh, immediate um, clinical interventions rather than waiting for the three or four hours it come, takes to come back from the lab. Right? And there are a number of requirements for point of care devices because it's quite important that all these needs are met, otherwise your point of care device won't go to market, you won't sell it. So first of all, it has to be convenient, it has to be easy to use and it has to have low maintenance. You can't have an engineer coming out to maintain your, your point of care, your, your glucose sensor. It has to be low cost, obviously it has to be cheap because people won't use it. Low power because you don't want to be changing the batteries every day. Um, it wants, you want it to provide very rapid uh, sensitive results, typically in less than five minutes. Um, so that implies it has to be label free and I'll explain what label free is further along. More importantly though, the detection limits and the sensitivity and the performance of the sensor has to be the same if not better than your clinical laboratory. You can't use a point of care device that gives you something that's maybe ish four times less sensitive just to give you an awareness. It has to be as good as what they'll do in a professional clinical laboratory. And because it's cheap, normally they're disposable. So nanosensor devices offer a potential uh, solution to achieve all these uh, prerequisites to make um, point of care type devices. So the ultimate goal, as I've said, is to move from this kind of um, approach now where um, surgery is required, say, to detect 100% I, uh, accurately pancreatic cancer, and here's, here's a picture of someone's pancreas, um, to moving towards um, a kind of device where you just take a simple pinprick of blood, um, that's put onto a chip which has uh, antibodies specific to biomarkers, and I'll explain all those, um, 
for that disease. So this blood test tells you very, very quickly earlier on whether you have a disease or not. And you can have multiple arrays of sensors on the chips, so it can test for multiple diseases simultaneously. And that's the, the goal. And Europe are investing uh, an awful lot of money to try and achieve these goals. Uh, and at Tindall, we're working um, in this area as well. Even, um, and I won't discuss the results because they're too premature, but we, we are working on this for pancreatic cancer to try and develop instrumentation that will allow um, a simple blood test to work. So what is an assay? Okay, so what, is, what are these blood tests? So this is what happens in, uh, in your clinical laboratory. You buy in a substrate, right? In, and they're normally in micro wells, and there's 96 of them on a plate, right? And on those, you have uh, an antibody, this Y-shaped uh, yolk here. You have an antibody specific for the target protein that you're interested in. The protein is your disease biomarker. It can be a, a number of different things. And if the protein, you then introduce your drop of blood. And if the protein is present, it'll bind to the antibody and it's trapped. And then you wash away the blood and you're left with the antibody and the protein present. But yet, you have to find out if it's there or not. So to find out if it's actually there, you need to go to the next step, which is to put on a secondary antibody with some sort of attachment chemistry that will then allow you to chemically attach a label. And then that label, oops, sorry. That label will allow you to do, uh, will give, usually it's a fluorescent signal that tells you if your, um, your, your, your target analyte or your protein of interest is there to begin with. And the intensity of that fluorescent signal can give some indication as to how much of it is there. But that has to be taken with a grain of salt because there's issues with fluorescence reproducibility. Um, this is how it's done. You need very qualified trained personnel who spend five years getting a degree. Um, they do it in these micro wells here, which you can see there's a lot of volume required. So you need about five cc's of blood. And you use a big machine and it takes, all of that could take four to five hours depending on the test you want to do. And remember we said you want to do this in less than five minutes. So the ideal then is to get rid of all this step and build something that does that. You have your target, you have your capture antibody, and as soon as it detects that the target analyte or your protein is there, it gives you a signal and it lets you know. Okay? So that's what nanosensors and some label-free sensors do. Okay, so this is just a, a, a kind of schematic of the elements of a whole nanosensor system. These are the, the, the analytes of interest that you might be looking for, so things like cell cultures or human samples, blood or urine. Obviously, it's a, outside of health, you have food, you have environment, you have security, explosives, that kind of thing. Um, but specifically for biosensors, then, you have your, your capture material, your little Y uh, on, uh, immobilized on your, on your chip surface. As well as that, you can use DNA, you can use cells, or you can use enzymes like glucose oxidase if you want to test for, for glucose. Then you have some sort of sensor device, so you might have a, an FET, a field effect transistor, kind of nanowire device, or you could have these nanowire arrays for electrochemistry, you could have nanocrystals or other kind of electrodes. And the idea of these is that that gives you an electrical signal if there's a binding event happening here. And then you have your electronics, that takes the electrical signal and it amplifies it up. It then goes some, through some uh, signal processing on a PC, and then it gives you out your, um, your data, and it gives you your result. Okay, so. Nanoscale sensors are, are good, like I mentioned it earlier on, because they're of similar length scale. So your sensor, your nanowire here is on a similar length scale to the, the analyte you're trying to detect. So if you're trying to detect proteins that are 8 nanometers in diameter, or radius, 16 nanometers in diameter, and you're using a sensor that's a millimeter wide, well, 10, 20 proteins isn't going to make much of an impact on that sensor. But if you, if you take the same 10, 20 proteins and you react that with a nanowire that's only 100 nanometers wide, or an anacrystal that's only 40 nanometers wide, that's going to give you a big signal. So by consequence of them being very, very small, you get lower limits of detection, and you also get increased sensitivity and selectivity because you have a higher signal to noise. Okay, so just to go through what nanomaterials are, um, these are the everyday kind of 3D um, materials we know. This is silicon, but it can be like grains of salt or sugar. So these have a 3D crystal structure. Um, and electrons are free to travel in all three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. Right? So we call them 3D materials. If you make a very thin film of those materials and say restrict the height maybe to 50 nanometers, so it can be infinite in, in width and length, um, but not in height, then the electrons or a photon or whatever you're looking for can only travel in the X and Y 
it can travel in the Z. So it's confined in that region, so we call those 2D nanostructures. If you make them smaller again, then you just make a nanoware. So uh, it's, only, it's only length, it doesn't have height, and it doesn't really have width. Well, then your, your material can only travel in one direction, and that's called a 1D structure. And finally, if you just make a quantum dot, so something really small like this uh, cadmium selenic nanocrystal here, which is only 5 nanometers in diameter, then the electron is trapped on it. It can't move at all. So we call those 0D, so that's a quantum well, or quantum dot. Um, we call these nanocrystals if the structure is crystalline, and as you can see here it is. If they're amorphous, like some gold or, or some glass, few silica, then they're just called nanoparticles, just to give that definition. So there's two ways of making these. We can either start by working from bulk materials and, and chipping away and making them much smaller, which we call a top-down approach, and that's the typical approach that the microelectronics industry would take, where they'd use uh, lithography and deposition techniques and etching techniques to make their chips. Alternatively, we can use the bottom-up approach where we start with individual building blocks, we self-assemble them together in some way, and uh, we build up to our final device. So I'm going to go through uh, these in turn. So I'm going to start with quantum dots. And quantum dots, believe it or not, are extremely pervasive as sensor devices in the marketplace to this day. And the most common one is your pregnancy test kit. Okay, And these work by, you introduce your analyte here with the... Um, human gonad, uh, chronic uh, gonadotrophin enzyme, this HCG. And if that, that's, that, that's um, present in the urine if you're pregnant. It's only present after uh, the egg has um, bound to the wall of the uterus. So it doesn't happen before that. And if that's present, it'll bind to these nanoparticles here, to these little Ys of the nanoparticles. Okay? And then it'll flow along the device, and it'll also bind to these little antibodies here, which are also specific to it. Okay? So here we have it binding here. You also then have a control line for another antibody which is common in the blood, and that's further up the assay, and that gives you your first line there. And that's just to show, that's this first line here, that's to show that the assay actually worked, that the sample got all the way up to the sensor, that the sensor chemistry was working properly, and uh, that everything has worked. So you can take the result, the result as, um, as positive or negative, depending on whether that, that second line um, approaches or not. Now, we call this a sensor, but it's not really, because it, it just gives you an on-off or a yes-no, because you're either pregnant or you're not pregnant, you're not half pregnant, right? So uh, it's a dosometer. It doesn't give you a concentration range, it just tells you yes or no, okay? Nanocrystals are also very, very good at finding more application, more as labels now than, than, than sensor, uh, sensors per se, and that's because of the quantum confinement effects within a nanocrystal itself. Remember I said it's zero, I meant zero D. So an electron or a charge can't move on it. It's stuck where it is. And depending on the size of that nanocrystal, okay, we can, um, na these nanocrystals in particular, most semiconductors, uh, when you shine ultraviolet light on them, depending if they're in the right size regime, they'll emit light back out. So they'll fluoresce back for you. And depending on the size of the nanocrystal, the color of the emission changes. Okay, so here we have a two nanometer cadmium selenide uh, nanocrystal and just by adding on a few atoms onto that nanocrystal during the synthesis just leaving the synthesis proceed that little bit longer you can make them you can double them in size and remember I said the carbon atom was only 0.2 of a nanometer uh, cadmium and selenide are much much bigger so you're, you're literally only talking a few atoms here um, you can tune the emission of these that, these devices from uh, blue to red so you can go all the way across the visible spectrum and these are finding great use now as stains for cells. Before we used to use these uh, molecular dyes, these stains that you'd, if anyone's done leave and cert biology, you had your cells and you dropped on this, this horrible stain that stained up the cell and you looked at particular parts of the cell down through a microscope. And you have a number of problems with that because um, it's an organic molecule for a start and it's, it's a solution. So it'll diffuse and wander all over uh, the cell and it'll stain up places that you mightn't want to stain, it'll get all over your hands and, and they're, just, they're just horrible to use. But more importantly, they suffer from what's called photobleaching. So you have to irradiate them with ultraviolet light to get them to glow back at you. But the ultraviolet light kills the dye. So it, it destroys the, the chemistry, the conjugation in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the chain that causes the colour to emit. So you can only look at them for a short time and then they start getting fainter and fainter and fainter. And if you're trying to look at small amounts of something, you're, you're going to have very little light to begin with. And you're going to have to really pump up the, um, the excitation to see as much light out as you can, and that kills it quicker. 
But nanocrystals, because they're, qu they're quantum confined, they don't suffer this photo bleaching at all. And what's really neat about the nanocrystals is you can tailor the surface chemistry of them. So when you make a crystal, you have, a, you have a, an outer layer of a material to keep them stable, to stop them gathering together and, and falling out of solution. And you, you can exploit that chemistry, that linker molecule around it, and attach an, a range of other molecules or biological molecules onto them, things like um, antibodies or DNA, single DNA strands. And that opens up a whole new toolbox for you. So you can put on antibodies, say, that would specifically target a part of a cell, like a, a nucleus or a mitochondria. And then you can introduce them into an area, it, it's say in a petri dish here, where you have your cells, and they'll be taken into the cell because they're so small, by the normal kind of endocytosis method that cells ingest their food by anyway. And once in the cell, then they'll wander around and they'll migrate and diffuse. And they'll eventually find, say, the area where they want to be. And then the antibody on the outside would recognize that area and they'll bind and they'll stay there. And they can be used as a stain. And by choosing that chemistry or that biomolecule, you can actually say, let me see, let me look for cancer cells or let me look for other kinds of disease defects within a cell. And these are some examples of, in the literature that were published. And you can see they were published 10 years ago. So this technology is, is growing and it, it, it's fairly well mature. And um, this, this was published there by Paul Alivasatis Group in Harvard. And these, these green cadmium selenide nanocrystals are targeting cancer cells, but they won't target non-cancerous cells. So they won't be taken up by non-cancerous cells. And to show that they've been taken up by the cell and not stuck to the outside, there's a series of images here where this is a, a bright field image of, uh, of cells. This is con called a confocal image and what confocal is, is it, it, as well as having x and y control at the light it also focuses in the z direction to about um about 100 microns in width in height so in volume so it goes x y and it goes z so you know that's in the center of the cell and um then you put the two of them together and you can see the nanocrystals in the cell so these are these are very uh, very interesting pieces of work uh, when they were published you can also do it in vivo all right so you can tailor the outside of the cell here to um or the nanocrystals here, um, to, to go to different organs of, um, of, of an animal or to, uh, say, tumour um, cells in an animal. And here's, again, some, um, some, uh, some examples of that. So you had a poor mouse, and uh, the, the nanocrystals were, 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 were chemically tailored, so they'd, they'd go to the heart, the liver, and the kidneys of the mouse. They were injected into the tail, and they were seen under ultraviolet illumination to have actually... Um, concentrated specifically in those areas only. Um, and then from there they went on to say, right, now we can know we can get them into the mouse, we know we can get them to target individual uh, organs. Can we target individual cells? And there they had uh, other laboratory mice, one which whom had a tumour and the other which didn't, and you can see that that tumour is growing, is glowing under the illumination, which shows that these nanocrystals can be used uh, to give an indication of disease. That's notwithstanding the possibility, the high possibility that these nanocrystals will cause their own diseases. So they probably won't be taken up in the marketplace to do this quite yet because um, these three, five materials, the cadmium, the selenide um, materials are quite toxic. So where they're very good to be used in a laboratory setting, they'll quite easily, as well as going into any cell of interest here, quite happily pass through your skin in your hand and there's huge concern, which has been researched extensively in, in UCD at the moment, about them crossing the blood-brain barrier or the placental barrier and affecting the unborn child. So there is huge issues regarding these types of nanocrystals and their uptake in, in the market and in the environment. And um, work is now undergoing on silicon nanocrystals, which aren't as, as toxic to kind of replace these, these materials here. So moving on to 1D structures or, or nanowires, um, there are a number of nanowire type devices, sensor devices, uh, on the marketplace, and um, these base these work on the basic that, on the same basis that your your transistor in your mobile phone or in your, your your computer work on. So a transistor works on the principle that you have two areas of silicon and a depleted area of silicon or a doped area of silicon in between, and you have a metal what they call a metal gate on top of that that doped region, and you apply a voltage there, and if you apply a voltage you make a charge, and by making the charge charge can flow from here to here. So when you apply the voltage charge can flow it's on. And when you turn off the voltage, charge can flow and your transistor is off. In a similar manner, you can use these very small nanowire devices um, to make a transistor. Because your proteins here of interest are also charged molecules, and because they're on the same size scale as your nanowire, they'll induce this kind of channel effect 
in your, in your nanowire. So when your molecules bind, you get uh, a conduction pathway, so it allows ch charge to flow from here, as we can see from these traces. And when they're not present, you get nothing. So these are three different transistors looking for antibodies. Um, antibody one is here, so that one increases, but it has no effect on the other two nanowires until the other two um, target proteins are introduced. And uh, this is done by the Lieber Group in Harvard, and they've, they've spun out a company um, trying to develop uh, tests for, pan for mm -hmm. prostate cancer based on the back of that. They've also demonstrated the same technology can be um, used to detect uh, single viruses, and this work was done really after the anthrax scare in the States after 9-11, um, to show that they could actually detect one single virus particle going onto the nanowire if they're that sensitive. Okay, and there's a number of different research groups across the world, mostly in the States, looking at these. And at the present, uh, there's only about two products on the marketplace, one in protein detection for microarrays, and one in actually, this was set up for the military, uh, but their technology turned out to be about this size, and it wasn't very amenable to be putting the soldiers back, so they found a new marketplace in the brewing industry instead. Um, down at the Tyndall, we're using, we're using nanowires, but we don't do field effect transistors because a huge disadvantage with them, which they don't say in the literature really, unless you read the fine print and the supporting information, is that you need to apply a 25 gate back voltage, up to 40 volt gate back voltage, onto the back of them to get them to work. And the engineers and physicists down in the Tyndall reassure me as a chemist that 40 volts DC can kill you. So they don't, they don't actually, so there, there will be, that will be a limiting factor in the uptake of uh, these devices. Instead, we're looking at um, electrochemistry, and I don't know if anyone has ever done electrochemistry here, but typically, uh, classical electrochemistry is done on uh, electrodes that are a number of microns, say 100, 200 microns in size. And as soon as you put them into a solution uh, and start doing your electrochemistry, you start depleting the molecules very, very close to the electrode. And this is a simulation showing the diffusion control or the diffusion process of, of, um, of that event. So this out here, this area out here, is, is your bulk concentration of material and as you go closer to the, the electrode which is just down here you can see by the, the color going from red to blue where blue is no material it's after being used up by the sensor because it's an electrochemical process so what happens is when as you do the electrochemistry you start losing your material here and that has to be replaced and replenished and that can only happen in one direction and that's from the top down a little bit from the sides but predominantly it comes down from the top and the consequence of that is as you speed it up uh, the analysis, uh, you end up getting these very large, ungainly kind of peaks or, or cyclic voltammograms. And that's not very good for sensing because it has a huge, what we call a, a parasitic capacitive um, input. That's why it's going from at low scan rate here, it's the red, which is nice. And if you increase the scan rate up, it goes to this blue. And um, this, all this area here is noise. And that, that increases your noise. It depletes, it depletes your signal to noise and it gives you a very low or very high Depends on what we look at. Not very good limit of detection, so it's, it's not very low. Whereas if you move to a nanowire, this is the same scale as that. So this is 10 microns here, sorry, that's 250 microns. So a single nanowire, this is 100 nanometers wide, it's really, really small. And because it's so small, analyte can get at it equally from all different um, directions simultaneously. So the, the output of that is, as you increase scan rate, you still get a small bit of capacitive increase from red to the blue, but that doesn't matter at all. And you can do much, much faster uh, analysis. You get much, because it's so low, if you look at the red here, it's about 0.7, and if you look at the blue, which is um, a thousand times faster, or 500 times faster, it's only um, doubled in signal. So we can say we can live with that, that's fine. Um, so that gives us a much higher signal to noise radio, uh, um, ratios, and that allows us to do very sensitive measurements very, very quickly. Okay, so we make these devices, I think I'm gonna have to speed up because I'm running out of time. Um, we make, a, we make single or multiple nanowire devices. We interconnect them down in the fab. Uh, Dan O'Connell does this um, with, with interconnection tracks, which, which we probe from the outside of the chip. And there's our single nanowire. And then we cover everything with a passivation layer, with a, with a plastic non-conducting layer, and open a hole in that so only the, 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 the material that we were interested in sensing can get to the nanowire, not to anywhere else, because this other metal allows us to do electrochemistry as well, which we, which we don't want. So these are our micrographs of, of our chips. This is the central region of a chip, which you'll see in the next slide. We have 12 E-beam fields. Uh, we write these nanowires using electron beam lithography, which is a typical microelectronics um, fabrication approach. And we can have as many nanowires in these gaps pretty much as we want. So here's a, 
a micrograph of one nanowire, here's a micrograph of four nanowires, we have seven, we have 20, uh, depending on what we're trying to test for. Um, this is the chip, so your nanowires that I just showed you are in the very, very centre here, and all the interconnection tracks come up to these pinouts on the edge, and that's connected to, um, that's put into a sample holder, and we use these little probes then to pin onto it, and that forms our electrical contact to the nanowire, goes all the way down. So this, this is our signal. In the absence of a nanolite, you can see on the scale, this is nanoamps, it's really low. We, we pretty much have very, very, very low background noise. And when we put in a, a very small concentration of the material we're looking for, we get a very high signal immediately. Okay, we've used this then. Why is that important? Well, this is this has allowed us to do very sensitive measurements. So we've used it recently. We've, we've published uh, glucose detection. And we've been able to drive the, the detection limit of glucose down to three micromolar. Now, capillary glucose, blood in your glucose, is typically between three and 12 micro, millimolar for healthy adults. If you go above and below that, you're in trouble. If you go below zero, you're dead. If you go below 15, you're pretty much dead as well. So why bother go down to three micromolar, which is a thousand times lower? And the reason for that is that in other um, bodily fluids, such as saliva and tears, which you can also use to detect glucose, the concentrations naturally occurring in those are much, much lower. And you have the option, of course, if you're testing tears for, for, for um, glucose, that it's not painful. I don't know if any of you know diabetics, but it's not, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a pinprick four times a day. I actually did it to myself yesterday. We got a present of one of the commercial ones, and I wanted to see what it was like, because I've heard it's sore. And I can assure you, it's sore. So to be doing that four times a day, it's only a little pinprick, but it's, still, it's, a, it's a sore pinprick. And uh, if you're doing that four times a day, seven days a week, I'm sure it gets quite annoying. So there is a huge drive to, um, to get these pain, painless glucose sensors out there, and there's a number of patents after being filed recently. We've also looked at... Um, Hydrogen peroxide, we've been able to detect hydrogen peroxide at very, very low concentrations, what we call picomolar, and that's important in, 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 uh, in health because it's a side product of many enzymatic kind of reactions, and you can tell if they're going right by measuring the amount of peroxide. Things like ovarian cancer cells produce hydrogen peroxide at higher concentrations, so it can be used as a biomarker to indicate that type of disease. As you go up to higher concentrations, it's produced by food as it starts spoiling or going off. So if you can put these sensors into the packaging of food, you can know without looking at the date whether the, the food is spoiled or not. And finally, when you go to really, really high concentrations, uh, like they did in Leeds there back in 7-7, um, when they were making the tube bombs, uh, the, the explosives that blew up the London Underground, their hydrogen peroxide was a key element in that as well. So the sensors we've developed can test actually all the way across those ranges. So it can test down to the picomolar all the way up to the, the millimolar. Which, which is important for, for all those sectors. Um, as I mentioned, security, we're also losing these nanowires. We're looking at detecting a variety of uh, explosive device analogs. So here we have DNT, which is an analog of TNT, and we have very low um, par parts per million uh, concentration detection limits in, in water, and we can push this even lower. Um, and we do some environmental analysis as well, again, using the nanowire sensor, and we, we look at copper. In, uh, in water and river water and that kind of thing, we're able to detect very low levels of copper. And copper is important because too much of it in the blood causes kidney failure. And uh, in bottled water, they, and in wine, it's limited to one part per million by the, the EU. Um, if I go on to um, 2D films, then uh, the, I mentioned earlier on label free uh, sensing, and the most popular label free sensor on the market is, is surface plasmon resonance. And every biochemical laboratory in, in pretty much in every university and every research lab will have one of these SPR machines. And it works like by, you shine gold with a bit of light. When the, when the gold hits the light, and the light has to be of the a right wavelength here, it excites what they call an electronic wave or a plasmon. And this migrates across the surface of, of the gold and what we call the dielectric, the air or the, the liquid out here. And it migrates along. And depending on what the properties of this material is here, will affect how that wave propagates. So as you start putting biomolecules onto the surface here, and then as they start binding onto other biomolecules during an assay, this light changes. So you end up getting different intensity spots on your, on your sensor here. And these are really, really sensitive. You can measure down to what they call uh, 10 to the minus 7 refractive index, index units. And to put that in English, you can measure picograms or nanograms of your analyte of interest in one mil of blood. So they're really, really sensitive. But one of the key problems is this is a small one, and this, this is about that big, sitting on our bench, right? So it's not for your point of care, and you need qualified people to run it. A major problem is, is the spot size here is about one millimeter squared. That, mean, that means it takes an awful lot of the material to be immobilized on the surface for it to work, and that, that material is expensive. 
to get 50 milligrams of an antibody could cost up to a thousand euro depending on where you buy it so you want to make this cheap so you want to make this spot as small as possible so these materials aren't very good for that and they're limited to maybe i think the best one on the market is you can do 16 measurements simultaneously you can't so the throughput is really really low this is an example of how it works just quickly you mobilize on your target antibody you get a shift in refractive index and this gives you a change in your peak here you react it with your analyte of interest again you get another shift and then you can put on a secondary label if you want and you can get another shift up there the very good thing about this is this takes about five minutes so it's very very fast because you got rid of all the labeling and all the, the need for all those steps um, you can do it quite quickly so what you can't do in throughput you can make up in speed a little bit um, but quite recently uh, back in 1998 nanoplasmonics emerged and what nanoplasmonics was um, discovered by a guy called Ebison who published it in Nature and what he found was if he shone light at a gold film, a very thin gold film, maybe 50 nanometers thick, uh, with holes in it, with little pores in it that were maybe 100, 200 nanometers, smaller than the wavelength of light, the amount of light that came through that was measured on the other side by a detector was much, much higher than what you would expect just allowed to go through the holes itself. And what he found was the same thing that happened in the surface plasmon machine at the SPR happened here on the nanoscale, and that the plasmons on this side of the film interacted with this side of the film and he got what extra arbitrary transmission and to prove that he made an array of these holes and he worked out the whole area of that array and then he made one big hole the same area as all as the array would be and he measured much more light coming through the array than he did coming through that one big hole and um, that's because the actual film itself was coupling light through for him and uh, what, what he also discovered and this work was done by Terry Odom uh, in the states is that if you change the refractive, refractive index of this material tree here and they use just different refractive index oils or salt concentrations to do the same thing. The emission, the, emit, the transmitted spectrum, so you shine white light here and what you measure up here with a detector, this is the spectrum that comes through depending on the, the, how far apart these holes are in, in the X and the Y direction. And by, by making these closer or smaller, you can move these peaks left or right depending on what you want to do. But by changing the refractive index here, he found that the peaks started shifting or or she found that the peaks started shifting over to the right just by uh, these molecules arriving on the surface. And these sensors can be as small as 10 microns by 10 microns. So you've gone from a, a spot size that's a millimeter by a millimeter down to something that's 10 microns by 10 microns. So it's much, much smaller. So consequently, you can make a lot more of them. You reduce the amount of probe material, just capture Y antibodies that you need. Uh, so you can do it a lot, lot cheaper. And this is some of the work that we're looking at. Uh, sorry, this is, this is some work that's been recently done in the, um, published in the literature. Uh, where they, they get these gold films. And here's a, here's a, just the image of the gold film with a load of different arrays of these sensors on them with different capture antibodies. And depending on how they glow here, the intensity, it depends on whether there is um, antibody, your protein of interest is there or not. And again, depending on the signal increase, it tells you how much of it is there. So not only is, is it quantitative telling you it's there, sorry, qualitative telling you it's there, it's quantitative telling you how much is there. And that's important in some applications. Okay, this is what we're doing in the Tyndall. Um, here you need a very complicated um, confocal microscope which costs about 60 grand to do your analysis for you. It's grand for the research lab but not very good if you want to have one in a doctor's surgery and do this quite cheap and rapidly. So we're looking at other ways where we take a gold film and we drill holes in it using a focused ion beam and um, we then have a chrome underlayer which we can chemically remove and I'll just run these videos because there's two little videos here and it's, it's easier to show if this mouse works right. So, here we have a gold film, we're after milling the holes in it, and then we, we etch away the chrome. So we use just an acid solution which selectively dissolves out the chrome, leaves the gold intact on top of the, uh, on top of the silicon. So this is the silicon floating on top of the, the water. And just by giving it a tap, you can see the silicon chip here is after falling away, and the gold film with the little holes in it is left floating on the surface of the water due to surface tension. And then we can, if we go on to the next one, this is very rough and ready now. These are the initial experiments. You can then Stop that. Technology. So you can then come along with a different substrate and you can put it in under, or you can use different self-assembly techniques here to assemble this gold film onto, say, a glass substrate here. You can put them onto fiber optics. You can put them on, onto emitters, so little lasers or little LEDs. And then you can do your analysis. And the interesting thing about that is they can be curved surfaces. They don't necessarily have to be flat and planar. And here's an example of, a, of us just putting it onto a microscope slide in the early days prior to us doing any work after. And then from there, uh, that's just um, a picture, a series of pictures of the holes. This is an optical micrograph. 
This is a zoom scanning uh, electron micrograph. This is just close in to show that they are actually very circular holes. The reproducibility is very good, and that the, the gap between them is 450 nanometers, which is what we wanted. And this is what's called an atomic force micrograph of them, which tells us it's very flat and very smooth, and uh, it's suitable for, uh, for further analysis. Having made them, we wanted to clean them, we wanted to biofunctionalize them. Normally, to do that to gold, you put it into acid to clean any organic uh, crud off the surface. You put these anywhere near acid, they get destroyed. So we had to develop a whole new clean that basically um, used a combination of solvent cleaning and, and UVO as analysis. So this is an AFM again, tell us the surface roughness. Prior to cleaning, this is uh, what they call contact angle, where you put a drop of liquid on the chip, and then you, t you take a photograph of it, and then you work out the angle here. And the higher the angle, the more hydrophobic or the more less liking of water it is. And you really want it to be more hydrophilic, so you want it to like water, so you can put on your, your, your molecules in, in, in different solutions. So when we did the clean, we went from 80 down to 52. We weren't sure if that would work. Normally, if you do it in acids, that goes down to about between 4 and 10, and you know you're away and you can work away. So we had to do a series of experiments then um, to see if we could uh, actually immobilize materials on it. And this, this, is, this is those. So this is, again, this is a clean gold atomic fork microscope. You can see the roughness there is only 1.6 microns. You put on your initial layer. Because it's only so small, that's three carbons. This whole thing is about a nanometer in size. You can't really ch detect uh, a change in roughness. However, as you start putting on the bigger molecules to do, allow you to do the surface chemistry, it starts getting a little bit rougher. So this is biotin. And then when you react that with streptavid in this big molecule here, you, you can see that it's getting much rougher from the, from the atomic fork force images. So that tells us that the, the gold surface is functional and that we can selectively put materials of our choice down on top of it. So to do that then we then, you, we then went and did the same assay I showed you earlier on in the SPR we repeated on, on the, uh, the, the film. And this scan here is only uh, 2 microns by, by 2 microns wide. Okay, and that's just a picture of clean gold and that's the transmission of the light going through that. And we then immobilise on our antibodies and we see our little shift in, uh, in, in the, 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 the peak arising from the refractive index change, and then when we react it with the target, we get a further peak. And that shift is very small. That's only about four or five nanometers, and that would be very hard to detect. But however, we've, we've tailored this peak by tuning the width, the gap between the pores, to be in, in this spectral region, because that spectral region is in the red. So 675 nanometers is red, and your laser pointers uh, uh, are typically that wavelength. So we can use a very, very cheap laser pointer as your light source. And initially, you have a very high intensity going through. But even after it's shifted only 4 nanometers or 5 nanometers, you see the intensity is after decreasing by 60%. And that's a very sensitive reading. That will give you a very low concentration of, uh, of analyte present. So I'm going to finish up there. But I want to give you, when I was preparing for this, I, I, I did a lot of Google, Google searching looking for roadmaps. Where is nano sensing going in the future? And um, there weren't any. There were very, very few. There were wish lists more than roadmaps. In the, in the microelectronics industry, you have a specific roadmap. We have to have achieved this level by there, this level by that, and this level by that. There was nothing for nanosensing. So what I'll show you is, is, is a video. that it, This is a concept video of a, of a project that's just starting in Europe. It's, it, it, well, it's hopefully starting in Europe to a tune of 100 million funding. And they want to build ubiquitous sensors in all different um, in an environment, and they're called guardian angels, and they're basically, the concept is here, and I'll show you, just to be aware, though, that this is also a sales video, so they're trying to pitch this to the politicians, but it gives you some idea of the vision that scientists have of, um, of sensors going forward. So, Guardian angels are a network of intelligent nanosensors, so small we don't even know they are there. They measure the vital signs of our body and communicate through an interface on a bracelet or cell phone to ensure our safety and health. These devices are autonomous. They take their energy from the immediate environment, the sun, vibrations and movement, or even changes in temperature. Integrated into the fabric of our clothing, for example, this technology is as easy to use as slipping on a pullover. Simple and intuitive, guardian angel devices protect the most fragile among us. They help parents take care of a child's needs and be there, no matter what happens. A technology that guides us through all stages of life. By bringing more security to seniors, 
they improve autonomy and offer the possibility of a higher quality of life. By interacting with your environment, these devices indicate how tired you are when you need it most. They can communicate with your vehicle and others on the road to guarantee your safety. They are precious aids in an ever-changing, fast-paced world for a smarter life. So we raise a little flag at this point, but um, that, that is the vision and the, there is a lot of work going, in, going into actually trying to achieve that at the moment. So finally, just to finish up, the really most important slide of the whole thing um, is, to, is to say a thank you, and particularly to say a thank you to, to my team who pretty much do all the work that I've shown here um, tonight. And that's to Pierre and Karen who are here, and then to Mickey, Daniel, Sean, Emily, and Colin, and of course to our uh, sponsors, so to um, the Seven Framework and TSFI for giving us the, the money and the support to allow us to do some of this work. So, sorry, I'm after running a little bit over, but I'm finished. Thank you very much. <laughs>